my notes a um, um, couple of days ago, and I'm very excited to be here to be talking about um, um, the beginning um, of the extermination of the mass extermination in, in Europe. So indeed the name of the uh, lecture is Until the Very Last Jew, which is the central theme uh, for Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, 2021. And the name of the uh, lecture, Until the Very Last Jew, actually embodies the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And the uniqueness of the Holocaust lies in the fact that it's, in its basis, it's a Jewish story. I know, I know that sometimes it tends to get political. I'm going to say it only in the beginning. I know that um, people sometimes, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the 120th uh, or the 21st century. We talk about uh, suffering of many nations and many groups, but at the, you know, at the end of the day, the Holocaust is a Jewish story. It's a unique story of Jews. And why is it so unique? What's the uniqueness of the Holocaust? The uniqueness of the Holocaust is, is, is in its totality. Only on the um, train car, you can find three generations of Jews, father, grandfather, and their grandson. And what was their only sin? Their only sin was that there were Jews. And that's what makes the Holocaust so, so, so unique as a Jewish story. Um, when I say that it's unique and it's, it's total, it also means that, you know, if you look at it, there was no reason. I mean, there is, has never been something that was like the Holocaust ever, ever. I know that people tend to call like the Armenian uh, a killing as Shoah or other killings as Shoah. But as a matter of fact, um, you can't come up with one situation in which a people like the German people, the Nazi party that took over Germany wanted to exterminate an ethnic group, not a country, not an army. There was no dispute over territories, no uh, fight between two trained armies. There was no reason uh, to fight over property, over some wrongdoing uh, of, of the Jewish people, nothing. There was no reason for that. And for this reason, for, for, for everything I just mentioned, we uh, call this Shoah a unique, unique story in its totality. So we said three generations on the, on the train. Uh, another um, another um, very important component of the Shoah that makes it very unique is the fact that the German, uh, the, the, the Nazis came up with a different definition of anti-Semitism. It wasn't the traditional anti-Semitism that um, relied very much on religion and on blood libels and, you know, making matzot with, with the blood of uh, uh, little um, Christian kids. It wasn't like that. What the Germans, the, what they came up with is that it's a matter of race. And how can you change your race? If you were born, um, I don't know, Caucasian or black, or, or if you were born Israeli or American or whatever, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Um, and they came, they gave that, they labeled the new anti-Semitism as genetic, as biological. And for that reason, not only were on the train three generations of Jews, but they also went four generations back. And if there was like a quarter or a one eighth of a Jew, then there was no chance for, for reconciliation, no chance for changing it whatsoever. So again, uh, that is why uh, the Shoah is a very unique Jewish story. Yes, we do acknowledge whenever I took groups to Poland, you do acknowledge the suffering of gay, um, gay people during the Holocaust, Jehovah Witnesses, the Roma, but if you look at the extent, the scope, uh, the level, if you look at the systematic uh, uh, killing till the very last Jew, you will not find a similar story. 
And I, I don't blame people when, you know, we call, we tend to call every event in history a show up. Just to uh, let you know that during the 20th century, 180 people, till the Shoah started, 180 million people died in different genocides. Still, the Shoah was a different red line. So I just, I think it's important to, um, to talk about it because when we talk about the Shoah as a unique uh, story, unique Jewish story, we do not mean to underestimate or disrespect suffering of other groups. It just, by its nature, you know, whatever happened in history uh, is uh, where the difference lies. Um, you know, it, I always think about uh, a very famous poem of Meir Wieseltier, who was a poet uh, in Israel. Actually, I don't think he passed away, so I think he's still alive. So he wrote, and I, I'll say it in Hebrew first, and then I'll translate it uh, into English. What was the word Shoah? Before the Shoah, two years before the Shoah, it was, it meant huge or big or colossal noise. So you have to understand that the Shoah, so just two years before the Shoah, the Shoah meant something else. So again, we're talking about something that was so, so, so different from anything, from any atrocity along history. Uh, the word Shoah meant big noise, okay? And the Shoah created, the Shoah created the need for us to come up with different words with different meanings, okay? So the Shoah is, is one of them. Or when we say I'm starving or I'm so sick or I'm frightened to death, you know, when we miss the bus or when we, uh, when we um, waiting for our lunch break, it's not the, the, the atrocities of the Holocaust created, um, you know, um, a different level of hunger, starvation, uh, fear that we are lacking the words. We're using the same words, but it is not the same situation. And I want to mention one more um, uh, aspect of language that has to do with the Shoah. And this is not just creating different meanings, but also co contamination. Contamination or uh, of, I call it contamination or of, um, of words the way we know them, concepts the way we know them. Train will never be the tr same again, right? Because trains will talk about it. Without trains, the Holocaust could have never happened. So we have trains, we have forest. What is forest for us? Forest is something very romantic, right? It's a, it's a place where fairy tales, uh, you know, take place and we go uh, on picnics. It will never be the same again because so many forest um, all over Europe, you know, became uh, um, um, death sites, killing sites. Uh, we have also faucets, you know, the, the, the cynicism of the Nazi uh, machine, a faucet that, you know, people look at a faucet and, you know, in a camp, in a death camp or site, and, you know, water is not gonna come out, but guess. So what happened to our language? And the reason I'm, I'm um, going all of this is uh, I think that it's very important for us to acknowledge the inability of any language to capture the size of the Shoah. Uh, and you know, very often, I'll just say something and then we'll move on straight to our topic that was just uh, beginning. I hope I'm not uh, boring you, it was just an introduction, but, um, um, anyway, sometimes it tends to get political. People use the Shoah or the remembrance for political reasons. I'll give you just two examples, which, which I hate, no matter if you're left or right. Um, for example, uh, um, a politician in Israel a while ago said that uh, the situation in Israel, he said, the situation in Israel now reminds me of Germany uh, uh, in 1938. I'm not even talking about political views. Where, what, where, where is the, the justification 
to even say something like that in terms of factual, you know, historical facts. There's no such thing. On the other hand, I remember in 2005, there was the disengagement in Israel, right? That um, Ariel Sharon uh, um, actually, we, you know, disengaged uh, from uh, Gaza Strip and you could see on TV settlers marching with a, with a yellow star on their, on their clothes. And I remember that, you know, I was furious because it doesn't matter if you have to leave your home, okay, nearby Gaza. It's not the same. It's not like the, like the Holocaust. So please, I, I keep telling whenever I, I come across something like that, I say, leave aside the Holocaust. We are not living in an era that situations or um, things that are happening are even one tenth close to, to history. So that was very important to see. I wanna just circle back to language and say that we call, for example, we no longer say uh, death camps. We don't call Auschwitz um, or Treblinka death camps because a camp has a different meaning. It has, you know, it's uh, you go in a summer camp or if you volunteer to the army, you are in a boot camp or whatever, but when 95% of Jews who arrived at Auschwitz-Birkenau went straight to their death, like left and right, and right on Tuesday meant death, and right on Wednesday meant life. You know, it was that arbitrary. And if you take other places like Treblinka, where 100% of the Jews, of the transports, upon arrival, were immediately sent to guest, guest chambers, we call it death site, definitely not a camp. Um, so um, this is something that was very important to me. So the date, um, June 22nd, 1941, uh, marks um, the eruption of a volcano. It was the beginning of the massacre of Jews in the Soviet uh, Union. I'm gonna say Soviet Union, it's former Soviet Union, but we're of course talking about 1941. The Nazi uh, Nazis launch uh, a surprise attack against uh, um, the um, treaty they had with the Soviets, uh, Ravensbrück-Molotov. I do not want to uh, bore you or exhaust you with uh, historical facts, but anyway, it was against uh, their previous uh, treaty with the Soviets, and that was the beginning of Barbarossa operation. And uh, Barbarossa Operation was the code name um, for the invasion of, I want to say, 4 million troops into uh, Soviet territories. Uh, the aim of uh, Barbarossa uh, Operation was to uh, dismantle or collapse the Bolshevism, the Russian Bolshevism. And um, here I wanna stop and say that throughout history, Jews were associated with Bolshevism, with communism, which the, with, which the Nazis um, swore to fight to death. They were very much against communism and, Judaism, uh, communism and Bolshevism. And throughout history, communism was associated with Jews. Some of it, you know, rightly, some of it wrongly, but it's true that many, many, many Jews did join or did follow communism and socialism and Bolshevism because after centuries of persecution as Jews around the world, all of a sudden communism promised, you know, uh, something different. Like um, um, it promised um, communal life, uh, equality, shared values of hard work, and it created a new identity, not based on religion, but based on same values of equality and labor and, and uh, um, just being the same. Anyway, the Germans really uh, wanted to collapse the, the, they ran a campaign against Bolshevism. So that was one purpose that they invaded in uh, 1941. And the other one, of course, was um, 
race, um, the, the Jewish story. As I said, many times they intertwined or intersected uh, uh, in the eyes of Germans, but not only in the eyes of Germans. Even after the war in Poland, there is the, the term Judok, Judok Komuna, like Jewish uh, uh, communism. Um, anyway, we're going back uh, uh, to our story. And um, I want to mention that there were two schools of thought regarding Hitler's actions. It was functionalism versus intentionalism. I hope I'm not, uh, these are too long, so I hope I'm not uh, mispronouncing them. But anyway, there are those who claim that uh, Hitler's action were a result of function of the need to respond to real-time situations, you know, ad hoc, uh, I guess that you say it also in English, ad hoc situations. Uh, and there were those who hold, uh, who held, you know, the intentionalism theory that uh, meaning Hitler intended to execute what he had planned. Uh, truth be told, um, Hitler was more leaning towards responding to ad hoc situations rather than to well-planned actions. In 1923, uh, Hitler uh, is sent, uh, is thrown into prison after organizing, um, or actually I should say failing to organize a coup d'etat or uh, a putsch uh, in uh, Germany. And uh, Hitler is thrown into prison for three years, I think. And there in prison, as I say, he's found guilty for treason and he goes to prison. And there he writes Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf in Germany, in German means uh, my battle, my struggle, whatever, my work. By the way, just a uh, fact, uh, I don't know how it is in the US, but in Israel, it is banned uh, from translation, um, the book. Only some excerpts from the book um, have been translated into Hebrew just for research purposes, but um, um, yeah, but uh, you cannot uh, obtain copy in Hebrew, uh, nor is it um, allowed to translate it into Hebrew by the law. Anyway, so Hitler is in, uh, is in, um, in prison and there he writes Mein Kampf, which is, no more than a mixed bag of ideological ideas, stereotype, anti stereotypes, anti Semitism, and stuff like that. There he portrays the Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Jews, and it's not new to you, um, according to Hitler, uh, were associated with um, money. Um, it's funny that, you know, it's, uh, I'm opening brackets here because. I don't know if you know, but the Christians did not allow Jews to be farmers. And at the same time, according to a Christian, I don't know which, which uh, stream or section of Christianity, but a Christian is not supposed to be a usurer. Is this, am I pronouncing the word um, like a lender? You're, you're correct. Yes. So that, you know, that left banking and commerce and, uh, um, you know, money investment and things like that uh, to Jews. So if anyone directed Jews towards uh, commerce and, and uh, other areas of uh, finance, it was uh, history, not Jews themselves. But anyway, there he writes, he portrays the Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. And he portrays the Jew as a dirty, conniving, immoral uh, creature. Um, of course, the Jew is always uh, dark skinned. Uh, he's short, ugly, with a huge nose. And um, uh, the German, of course, uh, the typical German was the opposite. There he writes not only about Judaism, he writes also about the need of society to get rid of the weak, to get rid of people that are sick. Why? To purify or actually to maintain the 
the race, the German race, the Aryan race, the master race to maintain it pure. And it's very important, bear that in mind, we're gonna get to that. By the way, he's not talking about Jews. He's talking about the weak or people that are mentally challenged or people that are disabled, you know, in any nation. He talks about also expansion to the East because since Germany in his um, vision, Germany is, uh, or Germans are the Aryan, the supreme race, they have every right, they are entitled to expand to the East and the Slavic nations are supposed to um, serve as their servants, as their laborers. Why? Because they are of, of just inferior race. So there is, um, um, Hitler built this pyramid of races. So of course you can find the uh, the Germans, and then you can find, I think, Nordic, Nordic uh, nations, and it goes all the way down. The Jews are not there, of course. They are Untermensch. Untermensch is a person that is not even. Untermensch is under, like, sub or no, you know, not a human being, while the German was the Ubermensch. So, anyway, he talks about all of this. However, if you think that in the book, Mein Kampf, there are like drawings or blueprints of guest chambers, then you're wrong. It's just, it started from words. You know, when I take groups to Auschwitz, you see a huge, um, I don't want to say like a vase of, you know, full of, you know, ashes. And on the other side, like across from it, you have the um, you have a saying by Hans Frank, who was the governor of the occupied territories, and he said, "I don't remember the saying, but something really hateful," and that shows you the short distance between words and actions. That words can actually kill. So he wrote uh, his manifest in prison but actually uh, did not think about the last details. And of course he mentioned, uh, um, he mentioned uh, guest chambers. So we're moving on. Another example for uh, those who maintain that it was, um, um, that Hitler was functionalist, like um, in favor of functionalism is the ghettos. So, the beginning of the ghettos started, they started building the ghettos in 1940s and 1940. And of course it meant um, expelling, isolating and persecuting Jews. They were forced to leave their homes and they were you know, confined in a super small um, area. And um, the ghettos all over, um, Poland actually inflicted hunger, forced labor, uh, expropriation, you know, taking over the, the Jewish property, which is, by the way, to this day, you know, uh, uh, it's been like 80 years after, and that's a different story. You have to understand that the vision of the SS of the German was very much linked to money, to sources to uh, exploiting the Jews, using them for labor, and then killing them, of building another SS country on the Alps. So money, some, 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 um, some Nazis, you know, gained money personally and just sent it back home. Uh, one example is by the way, Oskar Schindler. Oskar Schindler uh, was, uh, um, I think he was a Czech or an Austrian, I'm not sure, uh, manufacturer. And he was invited by the Nazis to um, start factories in Krakow, outside Krakow, it doesn't matter. Um, so he, he came to make money out of cheap labor. And he started as a very you know, devout Nazi who comes to Poland to make money. And some people say, if you watch the film, uh, uh, Schindler's List, that he uh, her, rides his horse on, a, on, you know, on one of the hills um, overlooking um, Plashov. 
and he sees uh, the commander uh, beating one of the prisoners to death, and that's where the turning point occurs. And you know, he composes a list of uh, thousand. Uh, he, I don't know if you know, but uh, Oscar Schindler is buried in Israel. You should uh, pay a visit if you go. Uh, it's the, I think it's a Latin uh, cemetery in Jerusalem. And not so many people know, but he was acknowledged as the righteous among the nations not so long ago. I want to say sometime in the 90s, um, mainly because of his background, you know, drinking and women and, and starting as a Nazi, but it doesn't matter. I, I recommend you watch the movie. Uh, so we're going back to our the ghettos that inflicting, uh, inflicted, as I say, the hunger and forced labor. And that created natural extermination, natural killing. People died in the ghetto like flies. There was, uh, sorry, there was bad uh, sanitation, no, you know, hygiene was horrible, no food. So people died in the streets and nobody buried them. So that was, you know, the, the Germans put the Jews in ghettos, A, because they didn't know what to do with them. You know, they invaded Poland in 1939 and all of a sudden, they have 3.5 millions under their uh, um, direct occupation and they don't know what to do with them. So that's the first thing. So let's put all of them together. People die, even better. And they were afraid of, of the Nazis themselves were afraid of diseases. So that's how ghettos started. Thousands, hundreds, I, I don't wanna say hundreds, but tens of thousands of Jews died in ghettos but it wasn't planned by the Germans. So that's a, another um, example how uh, functionalism took over intentionalism in the Holocaust. No premeditated uh, planning. Um, we're going back to summer 1941 um, and uh, Germany invades uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Union. And they um, of course perceive the, how should we call them? I don't want to say Russians because it's not, uh, okay. They perceive uh, Soviet uh, Union as, um, you know, ideological threat to the Nazi ideology, uh, communists, partisans, and of course, Jews. And um, they start with the following an order called the Commissar Order. I don't know if you wrote about it. The commissar order orders the units, the army units in the invaded territories in Soviet Union to kill any, uh, any Jew, any male Jew that is of working age, okay? Like healthy working male. We're not talking about women. We're not talking about children. We're not talking about the elders. Later on, let's say after three months, the circle of murder gradually expanded to all the Jews, men, women, and children. Again, it started from one specific order. And then, you know, from, um, um, it's like from bottom top, it just expanded to other uh, groups. Um, so how was the extermination? I don't know, you probably, you're all familiar with names like Bobby, uh, Bobby R, Ponari, which in Hebrew we say Ponar, and near Vilnius, uh, Vilna in Hebrew, uh, Lithuania, um, and uh, other places. Uh, we're talking about uh, very improvised uh, killing sites like uh, a ravine, a forest, sometimes army ditches, you know, just pits. Sometimes Jews were asked, were, I don't say asked, were ordered to um, dig uh, the pits. And uh, basically uh, what they did was um, they were asked, all the Jews, were asked together at a certain point. They were ordered together at a certain point. They were marched towards um, the forest, let's say. 
they were asked to uh, undress and uh, let hand over their valuables to the um, Nazi soldiers and their local helpers. And Leon, they, uh, Leon had raised his hand, so he don't. Yes, please. No, 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 I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay I'm sorry. No, okay. no, that's okay. So, um, so about close to a million Jews died this way in, in, in this improvised massacres uh, in the, you know, killing pits. Um, many managed to fled, you know, eastbound <laughs> towards uh, central, you know, Asia areas. Uh, they suffered from, I, I can't even explain, like, cold, hunger, diseases. But if they managed to uh, survive the war, then they were safe because the Nazis uh, didn't get all the way there. Um, anyway, the I don't wanna get into the war itself, but the war didn't go, the blitz uh, didn't go as planned for the Germans. And that's how they somehow um, extended the, the order and started killing um, um, children, women. I, I really urge you to go and uh, Google on YouTube the um, testimonies of people who survived. Some people survived uh, the pits, you know, the killing, uh, those um, killing sites because um, they just fell alive to uh, the pits. Some were buried alive from all the bodies that, that fell on them and some managed to climb out after the Jews, uh, after the Germans had left. So I think that uh, one of the turning points in the Israeli society was uh, in the beginning of the Eichmann trial. Um, people took the stand. I mean, Holocaust survivors took the stand and the first ones to describe what had happened to their families and to them were people that were in Ponari or in Babi Yar. And you should Google, I think the name was Rivka Yoselevska. And you know, people in Israel in 1961 were glued to the radio, listening to the trial. And all of a sudden they understood the suffering that Holocaust survivors went through, but that's a different, you know, it's a topic for a different uh, lecture. Anyway, many, whoever could uh, flee, um, uh, fled, uh, some became partisans, some hid in the forest, some uh, um, escaped uh, as uh, east as they could. But uh, the idea of the idea of moving on and finding a different um, systematic way to kill the Jews uh, started there. Started there, and I wanna describe a book and then go back to our topic. So I don't know how many of you read the book, uh, Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. Uh, Christopher Browning is a historian. I think he lives in North Carolina and he uh, conducted a research uh, of 500 uh, men, reservists, re, you know, reservists, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, that uh, were sent to Yosefov um, in the former um, Soviet Union in 1941. And they were asked to take part in the killing, 500 men. And uh, he conducted the research in the 60s. So he interviewed those people, you know, who were part of the unit. And in his um, book, it's fascinating to read how they describe the process of joining the killing machine, how the beginning was hard, you know, the, the orders and peer pressure and objecting the order. So what does it say about me? Do I hate Jews? Don't I hate Jews? What about recognizing people I know uh, around? Uh, some people got sick. Um, some people, you know, were anxious, didn't want to participate in, in killing, they didn't have any interest in it. Uh, but at the end of the day, gradually and slowly, 
they managed, you know, to overcome their fears and their uh, um, anxiety and just participated in the killing of tens of thousands of Jews. Why? Because it was easy, you know, they came from Germany and in Germany, the, pro the Nazi pro propaganda for 10 years, you know, um, uh, depicted the Jew as a mouse, as a rat, as a person who has no, um, no right to live. And all of a sudden, they come to this uh, forest and they see the Jews and now they're able to link, you know, the, the stereotype to the person. And from there, the, the um, you know, it was very short um, uh, to kill them. Uh, they didn't see, you know, they didn't see the Jews as part of the human family. And if you don't see people as part, you know, if you don't see them as humans, so, it didn't make it very hard for them to kill them. Um, clearly, uh, ordinary, um, you know, the um, Browning Browning's account um, demonstrate the important effect that the situation had on on the men. Okay, and uh, there he describes how eventually they were able to connect the anti-Semitism to uh, the killing. So anyway, going back to the mass killing, the Nazis thought that it was very hard to continue with the killing the way it was. Himmler, it is believed that Himmler, the head of the SS, uh, visits one of the killing pits in 1941 uh, in Soviet Union and he attends an actual killing and his co coat was splashed with blood, I'm sorry, and pieces of brain from the victims, and he almost uh, faints. And there he realizes that they needed to change the killing system. They needed to come up with something that was more systematic. So the Nazis had four desirable conditions for, for mass killing, for, for the extermination. First, Victims should remain unaware of what was going on. Yes, there was deception. There was, you know, the Holocaust could have never um, come to its extent without, you know, deceiving people, right? Uh, people got off the train and there was a sign to the, um, um, to the showers, okay? Or to the pool, or somebody said, uh, so where's the hotel? Someone said, just leave your stuff here on the ramp and we're gonna take you to your room. So it was built on deception, not because they, they had a problem of just, you know, shooting someone who, who, who didn't wanna get off the train or didn't wanna march to the um, gas chamber, but because, you know, it, it, it meant um, long hours of, of killing, it meant clogging the process, and they didn't want that to happen. So one was for the victims uh, uh, to remain unaware of what was going to happen. Second, uh, and most important, and that goes back to Himmler with a splash of blood on his coat. The perpetrators do not need to touch, see, or hear the victims when they die. So that's why later on they came with Cyclone B or with the carbon monoxide. I'm gonna talk about it. So that was the most important thing. So it's it's just unbelievable that Himmler, the 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 splash of blood did not, you know, um, did not touch him as a human being, saying like we are killing Jews. What are we doing? History will, you know, judge us. We will never be able to be forgiven by humanity. No, he fears for the mental, psychological emotional state of the soldiers. So that's why they thought that they needed to create this, this um, distance or distinction between the victim and the perpetrator. Uh, another um, component was uh, that the death um, blow should um, 
should avoid any uh, visual signs. You know that uh, in Ponari and Bobby Yard, they did get uh, the cooperation of many of the locals. By the way, if you want to watch The Devil Next Door, it's about uh, um, Ivan the Terrible. Uh, you probably know the Demian Yuk uh, a trial in Israel, but he was, he, was, um, he was not a Nazi. He was not a German. He was someone local who was uh, uh, an avid, you know, um, anti-Semite who wanted to take part in the killing. Um, so, but not all locals joined the Nazis. So they want to create a distant area of, of extermination. And the final uh, condition was that the death blow would be instant. Instant, like within minutes. And that's how in November, 1941, they started building uh, three killing sites uh, called the um, uh, Reinhard, Operation Reinhard, uh, after one of the commanders, doesn't matter. And they started building three killing sites, Treblinka, Belgitz, and uh, Subibor. And they were like thinking, how are we going to execute this mass killing? And that sent them back to 1937, I think they started, or 38, I'm not sure. For three years, there was a secret operation in Berlin called T4. And under this operation, which was called euthanasia. I, is it the same in English? Am I mispronouncing it? Killing people out of mercy? You say it correctly. Okay. So 100,000 Germans that were, you know, mentally ill or disabled or had other issues, 100,000 Germans were killed in this um, place in Berlin. And uh, when they came to Reinhardt, you know, killing the Jews, they said, we have the technology. We have the technology from killing the ill and the disabled, the German uh, ill and disabled six uh, or four years ago. And we have the technology, the carbon monoxide. We have the staff, the people who participated in the killing. And that was the basis um, to um, the second stage of extermination. I want to say that, you know, um, the Holocaust could have never happened without the advancement of technology. And, you know, it's like a vicious circle. What, what comes first, the advancement or misusing it or abusing it? You have to understand that there were several factors why the Nazis were so successful in massively killing. One was the trains, okay? You cannot, you know, uh, um, transport thousands of people without using trans trains. So they had trains, they had the rails, they sometimes did work on, on the rails, but they had the technology. Another technology was gas chambers. They had it from the previous operation in Germany. So they had gas and they had scientists from Berlin who come to check the uh, gas chambers. And just like, you know, as horrific as it sounds, just like you call, you know, uh, Verizon or AT&T or any other company and you request service, someone, a technician to come to your house, that's how technicians, technicians came, came and gave support to the staff if something didn't go well in one of those chambers. So we have the trains, we have guest chambers, and later on the crematorium, ovens. And what they did was take regular ovens and convert them into the crematorium uh, ovens that they used. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's cynical because uh, technology is supposed to benefit people, not to um, be used by people to kill others. But that was the situation. So, and then we had to, uh, the last phase, uh, which is the Van Zee conference. And it is mistakenly believed that there they decided 
on the final solution to the Jewish question, which is not true. There, 15 um, SS um, officials, executives, convened in this very peaceful area. You should go there. I went with my daughter uh, once I was uh, in, Ber we were in Berlin and we took uh, a trip to this beautiful green villa sitting on a lake that, you know, there, the dissonance between the views and whatever happened in the villa was, was uh, more than we could take. Anyway, so uh, there in uh, January, 1942, they convened and they discussed how to step up, how to accelerate the uh, killing um, of Jews. And there they came with numbers and maps and that's where you can think that planning uh, came to its final, crystallized into its final phase. Um, believe it or not, out of 15 uh, attendees, I think eight or nine had the title of doctors. Doctors, like really, you know, Germans who enjoyed classic music, who read uh, Gitte and Scheller, and who were very educated very eloquent people who could uh, play uh, piano, whatever. And at the same time, they signed the uh, orders that actually instructed the building, building of uh, converting part of Auschwitz into what we call Birkenau. Uh, we, we will not start with the Auschwitz, that's a different story. Uh, but I don't think that people realize that, as I say, 95% of the people who got off the ramp, um, you know, the ramp um, in Auschwitz were immediately sent to guest chambers. Only about 5% of people who were healthy uh, were chosen um, to work. And again, make no mistake, they were all supposed to die eventually, but for the purposes of the work, for their needs, you know, of... Uh, um, uh, manufacturing boots and missiles and stuff like that, they kept some of the Jews alive. So, and um, the extermination culminates in the, I, 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 I'm looking for the right words, um, the horrific uh, extermination of the Jews of Hungary in uh, spring 1944. And for that, they expanded the, the rails and they did some work on the trains. And within five weeks, over 400 Jews of Germany, of uh, sorry, uh, from Hungary, uh, went um, to their death, straight from the trains um, to the guest chambers, 1944. So as we can see, um, as we can see, there was an evolve an involvement of of planning and executing um, death, you know, um, extermination and and uh, death techniques and and uh, and um, places, but it did not start when he wrote my Kampf, and it did not start with Nuremberg laws, and it did not stop when Jews were for you know were not allowed to go into a bakery and buy cakes for their five o'clock tea. And they were not allowed to share uh, a bench on the, in the park with, with a German. But it shows us that words do kill. And it didn't take very long from ideology to come into actions and deeds. I can go on forever, but um, I don't wanna, bore you. So I want to open the floor for questions. If you have any for me. Everything was clear. Okay, perfect. So yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Sure. This is Martin. Hi, Martin. I recognize your voice. Yeah. So actually what you left out, but you, you said so much and we only have an hour, I guess. The big disgrace of World War II is that the railroads were not bombed. Right. 
in the Netherlands. Let me just go quickly to the Netherlands and then I go to Auschwitz. It took the Dutch government in exile the, night, the summer of 1944, when most of the Jews already had gone to Auschwitz, uh, Sobibor mostly, finally declaring a railroad strike. And the Germans had warned, if you go on strike, there will be consequences, severe consequences. But it had come to a point where the Dutch government had no choice. Again, unfortunately, it was too late. So Dutch Jews had the highest amount as a percentage of the total Jewish population transported to the death, or I'm sorry, we're not using the name death, uh, yeah, death camps, uh, unfortunately, and very few came back. So a lot of that could have been prevented if they would have bombed the railroads. And we had the airplanes, we know we had the airplanes, we know they had the power to do that. And then there was when you a say they, who do you mean? The allies? Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually there was a conference between uh, Roosevelt and Churchill mm -hmm. in uh, yeah. exactly what it was. By 1943, the spring, Roosevelt knew what was going on in the camps, that there was extermination going on. So there was a conference between him and Churchill. And he suggested to Churchill that the Royal Air Force, that was more their territory because the uh, 88th Air Force, which was the American Air Force, was uh, operating more in the north of Germany and trying to get rid, uh, uh, destroy the infrastructure. So, and Churchill said no. And Roosevelt asked, well, why? He said, because it's my belief that if we keep our bombing effort concentrated on the infrastructure and all the other things that we can do to, to by that time, the war will be over sooner. That was his opinion. And of course, after the war, we all said, well, you know, it was just Jewish lives. Why worry? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I love I love Winston Churchill. My father loved him, always spoke very highly of him. But I remember we talked about that. That was an absolute disgrace. Because, and, and you just mentioned uh, Hungary. By the way, there was not 400. There was 400,000 Jews. 400,000, yeah. You said 400. Of course, yeah. <laughs> So, For that, you don't need five weeks. Right. So that could have all, think about it, that could have all been prevented if they had bombed the railroads. Sure. Because if they take care of that, there was nothing, because the Germans by that time in 44, they needed their troops in the front. They did not have enough manpower to repair uh, the railroads. So yeah, I, I want to talk about it a little bit. Uh, thank you for bringing, uh, you know, I was thinking about this topic uh, as I was concluding uh, my lecture, but uh, thank you anyway for, for mm -hmm. bringing it um, up. So it's funny that if you go to the Holocaust Museum in, in, uh, in Washington, you go inside and you see, the first thing that you see is in my opinion, very political, the liberation of the camps by the allies, by the Americans. Yes. It's the elevator and it's so funny because Yes, it's a valid question. How come you did not bomb the railroads, the infrastructures? Yes. And the reason, as you said, was because they had a bank of other targets, yes. military ones. For example, they preferred to bomb Bune Monovitz. Bune Monovitz was the, um, like, uh, uh, it was called Auschwitz III. So you have Auschwitz, the, the camp, yes, um, yes. you have Aus Birkenau, the Rose. death camp, and you had Bune Manovitz, where, what's his yeah. name, where both Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel were. Anyway, so there, they preferred to bomb, you know, the factories mm -hmm. that were manufacturing stuff for the German army, rather yeah. than bomb the railroads, and that definitely could have saved oh, the Jews oh. of Hungary. Definitely. The Jews of Holland were dead, you know, had been killed during 1942. But it could have, uh, it could have saved the lives of the 
of the Hungarian of the jury. Yeah. And yeah. did they know about it? Did the Americans, did the allies know about it? Yes. Yeah. They knew what was going on in the camps. You know, it, you can read about it online from the uh, escape of two Jewish prisoners uh, uh, who composed this uh, uh, report that was handed into Roosevelt, uh, uh, Ver uh, Verba Wertzler report, yeah. um, into other things. They knew what was going on, and yet uh, for other reasons, they decided not to bomb yeah. Auschwitz and other places. Yeah. Very sad part, yeah. Night, 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 night. Yeah. I have a question. Um, V, uh, obviously, Vichy France was uh, was many of their leaders after France fell and they, they organized the government became Vichy France, uh, you know, basically collaborating with the Germans. Um, many of the uh, Vichy officials did uh, collaborate with the uh, Nazis. Um, what about in North Africa? Uh, like, and was yeah. there an organization of any work camp yeah. or any, for that period of time or anything? So like I, I, I am very, you know, it's uh, when it comes to military, the military, um, um, you know, <laughs> actions during uh, World War II. Uh, I am. Let's just say that Itzik uh, knows more about battles than I do. But I just want to say that you're right. So they were very close to uh, getting, you know, uh, into killing uh, the Jews of North Africa. Uh, and also, by the way, Israel, they were that close into, you know, um, entering Palestine, but thank God the El Almain uh, battle. It was El Almain, Yes. yes El Almain battle managed to, to, to stop them. Yes, they were, I know, you know, I, I uh, one of my teachers uh, at Yad Vashem say that he happened to, uh, to visit uh, a teeny tiny island in Norway. I don't know. And there he saw this, you know, uh, plaque in remembrance of one Jew who lived there. Yeah. So this is the, you know, it's the embodiment, it's the capsule of the name of the lecture till the very last Jew, North Africa, Palestine, wherever they were. If they didn't get to North Africa the way they wanted, you know, they started. And I want to say something about it. I'm, you know, I'm from, my parents are Moroccan. But when I read about how people complain that you know, um, whatever was happening in uh, Libya or Tunisia or uh, Morocco was never brought to the attention of people after World War II. With all due respect, it's a European story. Yeah. I, I'm not underestimating it, but to see that it's part of depriving yeah. the North African Jews, this is something that I personally cannot accept. Uh, I'll tell you what I agree with. Up till the mid 80s, beginning of 90s in Israel, we did not hear anything about the extermination of the Jews of Greece. Wow. The Jews of Greece, we didn't know anything. The Salonika. Yeah. Salonika. Yeah. Oh, it's like 44,000. 44,000. It's like how, how, I don't know how we grew up without knowing about it. Yeah. But I guess, you know, sometimes it's, um, I don't know, it's like uh, uh, shaping or it's a very, uh, that's, that's a topic for a different lecture, shaping or engineering or-, or can, I add, can I add something yeah. else as far as, North, oops. as far as North Africa and the Jews? Um, so, when the, the Nazis or the Germans, whatever, went into North Africa, their commander in chief was uh, the famous general, Erwin Rommel. He was strictly a military guy. And he was, time and time and again, he was put on the stress, especially by the SS, that, you know, if they came and come Jews, they should pick them up, make a camp, or do something with them. Nothing good, of course. And he ignored it. 
time again, he, you know, he told him, he said, listen, I'm fighting a war here. I don't have time. And uh, besides that, he was not uh, a believer in the extermination of the Jews. And we found that out, of course, he was part of the plot to kill Hitler. The because he was one of the, uh, the top generals uh, who would take over uh, the Wehrmacht army and then uh, sue for peace with the allies. So thank goodness, you know, I mean, he was a Nazi, he was a German, but Erwin Rommel said, no, we, I, I, I'm here to fight, to do a job. I'm not gonna worry about the Jews. Thank you. Yeah. Sammy? No me. Yes. Um, all the talks I uh, heard about in the Holocaust, no one mentions the Lithuanians. They they taught how to kill the Jews in 1941. A hundred thousand Jews were killed in the forest of Lithuania. I was there. I, I did visit. Yeah, true. That's my first question. The second question. When the United Commission went to visit Treblinka, which I was there in Prague, they told them the Nazi. You mean, you mean Theresienstadt? Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt, yeah, I was there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So the bathroom had, uh, I don't remember if it was 75 sinks to wash the face or 100 sinks, and even there was no running water. Up to date, there was no running water. Yeah. They, they How it. could, you know, the Commission of the United, the United Nations, they couldn't even check if it's... If it's These are very know. good questions, you know. It, next, uh, to it, it, yeah. next, next to it, you know, we saw the camp, we saw the, we visited, you know, the, the ovens where they, they killed the Jews and this and that, and I'm talking at that time, nobody, you know, nobody, yeah. nobody cared. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you, and uh, um, they um, all put together, they put together, um, they put together, you know, uh, they faked the, 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 the whole thing for the uh, United Nations in resin, they fed the kids, and they dress them in, in uh, nice clothes. And yes, they manage uh, with their uh, scheme. Um, you know, in, our, in, in Jerusalem, in Yad Vashem, there's a, a room that is called the big question room. You raised many valid questions. How come they didn't bomb Auschwitz? So, you know, there are questions there. You should go there. And there are like so many videos uh, and so many questions on the wall, like on the walls, like where was God during the Holocaust? It's a valid question. You know, it's a, it's a question of, of uh, it's a religious question. People ask themselves, where was God during the Holocaust? So one of them was, where was the world? How didn't they bomb Auschwitz? How could uh, the Nazis trick uh, uh, the entire world? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess, um, yeah, the, Your the questions thing, are very good. I don't remember what was the first thing you said, Sammy. What was the first? Uh, my, 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 oh, my about uh, <clears throat> oh yeah. So the cooperation. We have to be careful with. Um, I just want to say that the local uh, uh, populations, wherever the Nazis committed um, killings, like. Uh, in former uh, Soviet uh, Union or in Poland or in other places. I guess it could not have happened without the help of many, many locals who were so happy to get rid of the Jews. However, although many of the Poles or many of the oh Russians God. or others were anti-Semitic, the German people that the Nazis were the ones who executed per, per, perpetra yeah, were the perpetrators of the Holocaust. We have to remember that because sometimes in Israel, we tend to forget uh, the role of the Nazis. And we say like uh, the Poles, they betrayed the Jews. They were their neighbors for uh, hundreds of years and uh, which is true, but they assisted the Nazis. They helped them. 
but they did not come up with the technologies, the planning, the, the transporting and everything. They were their helpers. By the way, the, the, um, the Nazis looked down at them, you know, like the, as I say, they wanted them to eventually after the war, once they get rid of, of the Jews, they wanted them to serve them, um, be their servants because they were not um, uh, part of the Aryan race. I, I want to say something. Um, I am Moroccan and as far as I'm concerned, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the North African Jews were saved by the King of Morocco. The King of Morocco is the one who saved the, the North African Jews. Why? Because Maréchal Pétain came to Morocco by, by the order of Hitler and Vichy and all that. And he said, we went around the Jews. He said, you cannot touch the Jews. Before you touch the Jews, you take me first. I the one to go first before the Jewish people. So we owe our lives as Moroccan, as North Africa. We really owe our lives to the King of Morocco who went from Mohammed V to his son, Hassan II, and now to Mohammed the sixth. So that's how lucky we were to be saved right, by the right. king. Yeah, as I said, you're right. Thank you for your comment. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> the story of the Holocaust. Uh, years ago, it was one story. Now in the postmodern times, you know, it has been um, uh, broken into, you know, small narratives. So you have uh, narratives of, uh, of the gay community. You have the narrative of uh, uh, North Africans and you have the narrative of, of women in the Holocaust and of children in the Holocaust, which is a, a, a huge tragedy, the story of women in the Holocaust among all other tragedies. But even within inside uh, North Africa, there were differences as you said, because uh, Libya was ruled by the Italians who were, you know, uh, um, who cooperated with uh, Mussolini, cooperated with uh, Hitler, unlike in, in Morocco and Algeria. So you're right in that sense. So they suffered more in, in Libya due to that um, factor. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, uh, there's a lot to discuss and a lot to, um, a lot to talk about. And- um, Turkey, was also, Turkey was very lucky country that uh, the, President of Turkey, Inanu, was able to convince the Germans not to come to Turkey to go direct to Russia. And they saved a lot of life in yeah. Turkey. We were Thank very lucky. We were and very lucky. You you do you live there during World War II? Yes, yes. What do you remember from what from that time? Well, I, I was 11, 12 years old, but I don't remember too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah so um I, I started, and I'll conclude with that. I started saying that a friend of mine, not a friend, but a teacher um, um, happened to be in this uh, teeny tiny um, Norwegian island. And there he saw a plaque, you know, commemorating a name of one Jew who lived in this island, who had lived in the, in the island before the Nazis came. And I think that it's the, um, if you want to, um, it, it, it's in one sentence or this one name is what we call till the very last Jew. That was the plan to get rid of all throughout the world, to get rid of all the Jews wherever they are. As I said, they did not begin with that in 1939, nor in 1940, definitely 90, not in 1933, and so on. But um, that was the plan, uh, because um, as I said, uh, even if, you, by the way, there, it's a big tragedy. We, we don't have time to talk about it, but some Jews tried to convert uh, in Germany or in Poland, thinking that it might help them. Um, you know, it did not. It did not. Not only did they excommunicate themselves from, from the Jewish community, but they were not accepted by the Germans because there was no such thing as conversion. 
as opposed to the traditional anti-Semitism. If you convert, then, then you, know, you will be forgiven according to the New Testimony. But um, it did not help uh, those converts. Um, so, um, yeah. Hi, this is Rabbi Dahan, if I may add one comment. By the way, amazing, Naomi. Thank you. Now let's surpass everything. You mentioned one thing is you ask, where was God in the Holocaust? We should also ask ourselves sometime, what were we, the Jewish people in the Holocaust? Meaning how many Jews in Europe left Hashem? And that's why Hitler went four generations back that the Enlightenment program and the movement of Moshe Mendelssohn and all his friends, they were basically took all the yeshiva boys out of yeshivot. They took all the Jewish people out of their own so-called ghetto of shtetls and such and put them into the Polish, the Romanian, the German. And the assimilation was rampant. Sometimes we forget we bring disaster on ourselves. So I should ask the two questions. Were, were the Jewish people, where was the Torah in the Holocaust? Just a point of lenience, because right now we, we come into a place like this in Israel. You see the chaos in Israel. And we ask ourselves, why we bring all this, you know, war upon us, this hatred between us? It's just a point of thoughts. Nothing justify a Holocaust, needless to say. But in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, the entire Holocaust is hidden in chapter 32. And the main thing that Hashem says, I will hide my face from you when you leave me. So we need to always remember that and always have Hashem protection with us. Never leave Hashem. Just have a point of contention. This is, by the way, said by a professor that he lost his entire family in the Holocaust and he became a Baal Shuva. Today he teaches all over the world. Says, I always ask Hashem, he, he used to say, I have one survived from 25 people in our family. And we always ask, where was Hashem? And in the past 40 years, he started asking the other questions. What were we in the Holocaust? We became basically like everybody else. We lost the protection of Hashem. That's all I wanted to just add to it. Thank you. Thank you. Benson? Does anybody else have anything to ask of, for Naomi for a wonderful presentation? We thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Uh, I'll come again next year. And uh, yeah, I, I hope I wasn't, you know, um, jumping from one topic to another. I had so many uh, topics for, for lectures. Um, and I tried to touch on so many things, so, but, um, very nice. Very well we were done. okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you were awesome. It was great. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We have a number of well, events coming up, so watch uh, for the emails that are coming from Magda Naveed. So we have a lot of great events coming up. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Vincent. Bye. 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 Bye.